like to welcome you to our midweek Bible study for November the 4th. Our focus this week is on Amos chapter 5, beginning in verse 18. I'd like to read with you those verses this time. Uh, the prophet, speaking the word of the Lord, says, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will, be, it will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness? I hate, I despise your religious feast. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offering and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never failing stream. As we look at this section of Amos, we come across the terms justice and righteousness. Uh, biblically uh, speaking, these ideas are overlapping. We see in uh, Amos uh, 5.24, let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Uh, we've noticed often in reading the Old Testament uh, that um, there is a sense of parallelism in the lines uh, of the text in much of the Old Testament writing, uh, quite a bit different from what is often a narrative uh, rendering in the New Testament. But this idea of the parallel, uh, you have one line, uh, let justice roll alone like a river, uh, and then... Uh, the next line, righteousness like a never failing stream. And so you find the, uh, the interpretation, the meaning of the first line, let justice roll along like a river. The takeaway from that would be very similar, if not identical to the idea of righteousness, let it roll on like a never failing stream. Uh, so the parallelism suggests that the meaning of line one is very similar to the meaning of line two. Uh, likely much of that uh, truth, much of that teaching was passed down often in an oral style. So this poetic rendering would have been much easier to remember and to pass on uh, where you don't have the benefit of, a, of always having a uh, written text. But the idea of justice and righteousness being parallel or at least uh, being overlapped is very uh, appropriate to, to bring that idea, <clears throat> is very appropriate as we look at these two terms, justice and righteousness uh, in the New Testament especially, but uh, some glance into the New Testament for a, a moment. But justice and righteousness in the Old Testament with their overlapping meaning, justice uh, understood very technically is that that action or that legal decision which uh, establishes something as right uh, and so in a sense uh, expresses a person's righteousness. Uh, justice begins in the biblical understanding, justice begins with holiness. <clears throat> God's justness, for God is just, is linked to God's righteousness because God is right. But then in a fuller understanding of God's justice, we find that God's justice can lead and is linked to God's forgiveness. Now, how can justice, where something uh, is either right or wrong, justice where uh, the rightness or the righteousness is demanded that something must uh, fall within certain parameters, how can justice be linked with forgiveness? I don't think we can understand that, at least not uh, in any ways fully uh, from a human perspective. But we see both ideas, or we see this idea, this connection between God's justice 
and God's forgiveness. We see this both in the Old and the New Testament uh, regarding God's response to our confession of sin. Perhaps the the best um, statement of this is in the New Testament, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful to God's gracious promise, not demanding uh, the strict justice of uh, punishment on the sinner always, but God's faithfulness to God's own gracious promise that God would be merciful to the sinner in response to the sinner's repentance and asking for forgiveness. And so God's faithfulness to God's gracious promise brings God to seek to forgive, holding God himself, holding himself in line with his graciousness leading to forgiveness. So to not forgive, according to God's plan, for God not to forgive would be a reflection of unjust behavior on the part of God. So God's mercy then equips, uh, the best word I can think of, God's mercy equips us to live righteously because of God's mercy, God declares us justified in God's sight in response to our forgiveness and our desire to walk in line with God. We are justified by faith in God's mercy and grace. See the connection even in the English language between the term justified and the term justice. So God bestows righteousness upon the unworthy so that the people of God who are unworthy but are made worthy by God because of God's faithfulness to his own plan. So God bestows righteousness so that the people of God in reflection of God's righteousness and of God's seeking justice, the people of God are called to seek justice, especially for those who are powerless to demand justice for themselves. We see in the Old Testament and in the New, uh, an emphasis on the people of God demanding, seeking, working for justice for those widows and orphans who were often the target of uh, injustice uh, by evil people. And so therefore, God called righteous people, God's people, uh, to seek justice on the part of those who could not demand it for themselves. Now, in the Old Testament, the, the term righteousness, as we see it uh, in Amos uh, 5, uh, 24, uh, righteousness is not uh, an an abstract concept. Righteousness is understood, excuse me, is understood uh, in relation to the context of God's covenant with God's people. Righteousness could be understood, um, perhaps oversimplified, uh, as an idea of reliability, especially as it relates to God and God's ways. Uh, God reliably responds to us uh, as we can expect God to respond. Uh, if we uh, seek God's forgiveness, if we are repentant, God is reliable to respond to us out of his grace and mercy and bring forgiveness and restoration for our lives. Uh, the biblical usage of righteousness uh, goes beyond uh, uh, this sense of living up to some absolute uh, arbitrary standard, uh, the, this reliability, righteousness uh, may refer to a person or an action or a thing that uh, meets or fulfills the requirements of some sort of uh, given situation or given relationship. In Leviticus 19.36, we have the... Uh, the demand from God in, in giving his people uh, the basic understanding of who they are and how they're to act uh, with each other. Uh, 
the command of God is you shall have righteous balances, righteous weights, a righteous ephah, a righteous hen, weight measurements, uh, types of measurements. He says you shall have righteous balances, righteous weights. I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt. So we find in that little verse there, uh, God's demand that the people of God uh, are righteous with each other in the marketplace. Uh, that the weights and balances that were used in uh, transactions in the market, that those be right weights and no false bottoms to baskets that would come later in the denunciations uh, of the prophets on some of the marketing uh, methods that were used uh, at different times in Israel's history. Uh, the weights, no thumbs on the on the weight, on the scales, the weights, the balances were to be righteous. Uh, usually it gets translated justice, but it's the, the term for, for righteousness that we see in Amos. Uh, so it, it's not just people that can be righteous. Uh, understanding that the weights and the balances were to be right, were to be righteous, were to be just. Uh, and so understanding that concept then in the lives of people uh, that our lives as the people of God individually and collectively, that our lives are to reflect this rightness uh, as we can expect that kind of rightness from God. Now, righteousness in the Old Testament is the responsibility of the king and the judges, those people of power. They are charged with uh, preserving the community of faith and the only way you keep people uh, together is if people are treated right by each other but also by people in power uh, if there was a dispute the judges were to decide in favor of the righteous the person who is in the right uh, and, but god above all others is the righteous one he's the one who preserves the uh, the relationship in the community of faith, this covenant relationship. Uh, God preserves this, one, by delivering God's people with righteous deeds or saving deeds, saving acts. Uh, God also uh, demonstrates uh, for the people of faith uh, how one uh, demands justice on behalf of the oppressed because God upholds uh, the cause of the oppressed. God brings justice to the innocent uh, and makes sure that uh, the those in need uh, hear uh, from God and are heard by God. Uh, yet for uh, those who are repentant, God's righteousness, as I've already mentioned, takes the form of deliverance. Uh, the, the, the righteous God calls on God's people uh, to make a right response, a righteous response of keeping God's law, of doing justice. And to do justice is to be righteous. And to be righteous is to work for justice. It's part of the reason Amos' words, as we read them a few minutes ago uh, in uh, verses 18 through 24, uh, for the most part, his words are, are very harsh as he uh, warns the people uh, from God, the warning from God, uh, that God will not tolerate their injustice or their unrighteousness. And then uh, go back just prior to 18 to 24, and you find out why this warning was so necessary. I want to read Amos 5, 10 through 17, and we get an idea of some of the things that were going on in Israel to uh, bring down this uh, threat of judgment on the people. Uh, Amos 5.10, you hate the one who reproves in court and despise him who tells the truth. You trample on the poor and force him to give you grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. You oppress the righteous and take bribes and you deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent man keeps silent at such times for the times are evil. 
Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord God Almighty says. There will be wailing in all the streets and cries of anguish in every public square. The farmers will be summoned to weep and the mourners to wail. There will be wailing in all the vineyards, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. So there were these charges of injustice against the other members of their faith community. These were all covenant people in covenant with God, which meant they were also in covenant with each other. And yet they were treating others with injustice. Uh, this was a word spoken against, especially against uh, those in power, whether it was political power or religious power. And those power systems were interwoven in ancient Israel. But the processes of the law were being used in favor of the rich against the poor. And God says in verse 11, those oppressive acts will bring God's appropriate punishment. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and exact a tribute of grain from them, though you built houses of well-hewn stone, you will not live in them. You planted pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink their wine. This is a direct threat from God followed up by a very specific destination for the people in verse 27. God says, therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. These elders and kings and leaders and people in power were supposed to deliver justice uh, in a similar way to those in power in other nations. But in Israel, there was a spiritual context to their judgments, to their leadership, to their actions. And that spiritual context was that of the covenant between the people and God that impacted not only their relationship with God, but their relationship with each other. And the duty to bring forth justice was a an essential part of God's law that was based on God's holiness. And in response to this, God promised security of the land. The standards for God's justice were very plain. There was to be an impartiality. There was to be shunning of bribes and, and any kind of influence that would pervert justice. Uh, even though they were to look impartially at needs, those in power were directed by God to watch for the rights of the poor, the needy, the needy, the fatherless, the afflicted, those who did not have power of, of, the, of the purse or, or power of uh, prestige or position. Uh, they were the, the lowest of the low on the social scale. And therefore, those in power were directed by God to be especially mindful of their needs. Uh, and their, uh, their lack of ability to uh, find justice any other way than at the hands of those in power. Uh, and, and God, through the prophets, holds uh, kings and judges and others in leadership accountable uh, to this very high standard. Uh, so even though justice is the responsibility of all in the covenant community. It must be demonstrated by leadership if the community as a to in, in totality is to experience God's gracious salvation because that salvation demands that the people in response to that salvation, the people show justice to others. Uh, indeed, to do justice is part of walking with God and displaying the same constant covenant love that God shows. Uh, Micah 6, 8 may be familiar to you. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? The answer to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. <laughs> 
Uh, and there again, reminding you of that parallel uh, meaning that's often there uh, to act justly and to love mercy is parallel with walking humbly with your God, because it is in that true uh, humility, not weakness. Humility is true. Humility is not meekness or weakness, uh, but it is the kind of meekness that we can have in the strength that we have with walking with God. But in that humility and meekness, we are compelled to act justly and to love mercy. This covenant love that we receive from God and that we share with the people of faith uh, is inseparable from our uh, our moral responsibilities, our ethical responsibilities to others, as well as our um, our spiritual responsibilities in relation to God and to God's people. Uh, these duties uh, have their reason to exist in, in God's coming salvation. So to do justice means to uh, work for the cause of the poor and oppressed, uh, to know their rights as well as we know our rights, and, and being a help to them to deal fairly in matters of, of business, uh, to show an impartiality that doesn't favor the rich. Read James 2 for a New Testament uh, conversation about this. Uh, and according to Jesus in the stories that he tells in Matthew 25, uh, but especially 31 to 46, uh, living justly means to care for the hungry, uh, the thirsty, the unclothed. Uh, and so a failure then, according to Amos, and we've already read this in chapter five, a failure to do justice only blinds people to the merciful justice of God's salvation. Uh, yet when we repent, God's glory can again shine in our lives. Seek good, Amos said, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as you say he is hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Let me bring this all together uh, and consider, especially as you look at it from the Old Testament, that justice is proof uh, of the covenant of God, someone has said. That God's covenant with the people that flows out into a covenant relationship with each other. Justice is, according to the prophet Hosea, we find this also in Proverbs, justice is better than sacrifices. Uh, for without justice, sacrifices and the keeping of holy days and all the other religious duties, without justice, all those religious duties are worthless, says God. Uh, think on these things. Hopefully they've given you some uh, opportunity foundation for further reflection uh, on Amos chapter 5. Uh, we will consider in uh, relation to Amos also uh, some of the, the teaching uh, we find in Joshua chapter 24 as the people of uh, God are getting ready to uh, take another step of faith in their relationship uh, with God, or at least as Joshua calls them out to make some commitments. Uh, so consider uh, these words and prayerfully prepare yourself to uh, join uh, with the rest of your community of faith and worship on Sunday, uh, whether you can come and be with us uh, in person or whether you uh, need to uh, continue worshiping uh, in uh, from a distance uh, remotely. Um, I pray that uh, the Lord's presence will be very real to you and his spirit will continue to eliminate uh, your examination of scripture so that you may continue to grow.